Empower Than Power Women podcast for your career and your life, no matter what business you're in. Goodness me, welcome to November and episode 29 of the Northern Power Women podcast. Career is a verb as well as a noun. I'm Sam Walker and this month we recorded our panel at DXC Technology in Newcastle where we talked about agile working, the future of conferences and which real or fictional Northern Power woman you'd put at the helm of the Northern Powerhouse. I chose uh, Brenda Hale, so she's the president of Supreme Court, appointed at the age of 72. What I find quite remarkable is that she was appointed by Theresa May, so it's quite nice to see one female leader appoint another female leader. The big interview is with Dr Joanna Berry, Associate Professor of Entrepreneurship at Durham University Business School, who talks about what it means to be a pracademic. Yeah, you'll find out. Also, why women still have an issue with their businesses getting funded and a really extraordinary inspirational tale that she tells about what she learned from losing everything. I was impoverished and my ego had taken a thorough battering. And the only thing that I could do was carry on. Plus, this month, there's more of your famous shout-outs. Find out if you've been mentioned. But first, let's catch up with the founder of Northern Power Women, Simone Roche, MBE, with some news from HQ. And it was a great start to the month of October. As Northern Power Women, we won our very first award at the Merseyside Independent Business Awards for Community Impact Awards. So fantastic news for all of our team and I'm so proud that we've won this award so we're absolutely chuffed to bits and um, we're talking about nominations and winning and please do get your nominations in for the fifth Northern Power Women Awards which the nominations close on the 7th of November so whether you're celebrating great organizations or great individuals blazing a trail please do get the nominations in northernpowerwomen.com forward slash awards look forward to re- reading some of these brilliant nominations we've also been out on the road we've been been over in brussels actually i was over with a delegation of manchester and liverpool city region combined authorities talking about the disparity of gender in the culture industries and had some fantastic roundtable discussions at the european commission many of which the actions are being taken forward there so onwards and upwards and it's that whole act locally impact globally or or your European on the, on this on this uh, instance but yeah it was a brilliant experience being over there with them and look forward to seeing what happens we held, held our second power circle in Liverpool a table of 23 impactful women all coming together for a common purpose to make change for our own city regions which is fantastic and look forward to sharing some of the impact on that we spoke at the first ever women in automotive awards i gave a keynote address there and that was fantastic representing brilliant brilliant women across the motor industry so really chuffed to, to speak at that also had lots of others were at the uh, the party conference in manchester talking on a panel at the university of birmingham that was fantastic Really exciting this month, we launched our mentor carousels, which is powered by our Northern Power Futures at the Tahidal Islam School for Girls on International Day of the Girl. We had 100 young women, future leaders, and we have 32 mentors coming in to have a conversation with each one of these groups. And that was just brilliant. We loved hearing some of the stories throughout for that. And then we took our mentor carousels on the road to Newcastle at DXC, where we had another one of our mentor carousels. And that was fantastic. We had great participants from, from DXC, from BT, and from some great independents and entrepreneurs and award-winning people within that from across the Northern Power Women community and Northern Power Future. So thanks so much for being in that. And thank you to our panellists this month, Tom, Michelle and Mahek, for being part of this brilliant podcast. We love the discussions. We love the chat. And thank you to Dr Joanna Berry for being our person with purpose and also for DXE for hosting us. Phew busy October get those nominations in please do northernpowerwomen.com forward slash awards and we'll see you next month thank you so much to the brilliant Simone congratulations on that award I am sure it is the first of many now each month we get together somewhere in the north to chat network and discuss some of the hottest topics around and this time we were in Newcastle (laughs) 
Welcome, welcome, welcome to DXC for episode 29 of the Northern Power Women podcast. And today we're over here in one of our favorite places over in Newcastle. We've had a busy morning this morning. We've been over here um, with our Northern Power Futures. George Stevenson High School have been here as part of the speed mentoring session that we've run. So a big round of applause for George Stevenson High School. As ever on the Northern Power Women podcast, we like to come across different parts of the the North and start different conversations. As ever, we have three fantastic panelists joining us this morning. We have Michelle Crosby, who's the UK and Ireland Digital Transformation Centre Lead at DXC Technology. She has been in an 18-year history in IT, covering many roles from programmer, technical lead, operations management, and capability development. Our next panelist is Mehek Mann, who's the Associate Network Infrastructure Designer for BT. A 2017 finalist of Procter & Gamble IT Business Challenge in Madrid, political enthusiast, and we need you right now, um, and formerly elected campaigns officer to represent young people at Youth Council and support youth MPs. She's fiercely passionate about diversity and inclusion. And finally, but not least, Thomas Jackson is the founder and photographer of Tynesight, and he is a live event content curator. Thomas is much in demand, covering global events such as South by Southwest and even has photographed Michelle Obama. So welcome, welcome everyone to our fantastic panel. We always like people to join in our conversation, so please do at northernpowerwomen.com forward slash podcast, hashtag NPW podcast, or send us in Ask the Hive questions. We always want to hear from you. So we're gonna start today's discussion with the first of our questions. So, Thomas, remote working is on the rise with 70% of younger employees preferring to work for businesses who offer it. Have you done it? Have your staff? And what are the pros and cons in your view? Thomas, this is definitely one for you as a photographer. Uh, yeah, it's kind of in my uh, in my wheelhouse. Um, personally, I think it's the future of working. I think the the days of being paid by the hour to be sitting in, in an office are numbered. There's some roles which require it, mainly medical professionals, that kind of thing is it's essential. But realistically, getting the job done is becoming more important than the time spent on the job. and. Therefore, where you do it is less important than how you do it. Michelle, I noticed from your bio that you talk about the best advice for anyone looking to lead is to listen to your teams and create an enviable workplace culture. So how does agile working work into into you and your culture, your business? Well, I worked at home in, in a role that I had for about two years, and, and I, I tend to disagree with, with, with what my friend here said. Oh, we, lo- we love a bit of debate on the podcast. Yeah. So I, I think depending on the role, then yes, working at home and working flexibly is, is, is really useful and helpful, if, if, especially if you've got children and family commitments. But, but in, my, in my role and in, in the teams that I lead, we find it, it's, you get a lot more out of collaborating with the teams and being involved in the office, talking to people across the desks. You, you, there's a real synergy that you can get from being in the office environment. And I think having flexible working is, is, is one thing where if you need to be at home, if you need to, to do something separately, you know, or you need to go away early, whatever it is, that's one thing. And I would totally encourage that. But when you've got that working in a team atmosphere it's it's a you get a lot done it's very productive and i also found when i was working at home your day never ends so you get up and and your laptop's on from half seven in the morning and your laptop is probably still on at midnight so you never switch off so the benefit of coming in the office is that you've actually got to go home time that might be six seven eight o'clock even sometimes but at least there's a definite closure to your day which I think sometimes, certainly when I was working at home, you just don't get, and 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 you might stop and you know put something in something in the oven to cook or whatever, or answer the door, but but it just doesn't end, and and, and I found it's it's quite a lonely environment too, so when when you don't have that social interaction and and you find that you sit with a headset on in in your you know your dining room table or whatever, for for twelve, fourteen, sixteen hours, 
it's just really soul destroying. And I think maybe the type of role as well, as you were saying, being a photographer, you're out and about meeting people. When you're sitting on calls in, in your one room with four walls, it's not really very in- enjoyable. And we have talked about this on previous Northern Power Women podcasts, where the whole mental health aspects that come with working at home, that the loneliness, the never being able to turn off, you know. Um, Matt, what do you think? I've just finished my graduate scheme on Friday, and I completely agree with Michelle. I personally hate working from home. I think especially early on in your career, it's so important to be in the office and get that informal mentoring, especially in a tech industry. You're learning new skill sets. And early on, like I said, it, you would have to be in the office and the networking opportunities you get you don't know when your next role is going to present itself and if you're working from home you haven't built those relationships and you wouldn't necessarily get those opportunities as you would have you know if you'd been in the office but I think there is something to be said that research actually shows more and more people are actually going home to do more focused work because there's so many distractions in the office you can't really ask someone to go away if they walk up to your desk so you know you do have to give them the time you know especially if you are a people manager you can't turn people away so a lot of people are working from home to get more focused work done but then on the contrary to that you know on the other hand you would struggle with your mental health purely because you never switch off your work environment you know you is your home environment as well so I think I personally am a fan of office working. I've worked for myself for quite a number of years and uh, my husband and I have an agreement on the side of a fridge that I was actually forced to sign because it was almost like that intervention because there was I was on my way to the fridge it was all good there was a bonus in it but it was I had to, I had to have because I was it was that difficult of going oh well I'll just do this I'll just do this so we we actually wrote a Monday to Monday through Sunday agreement about when I could work and when I couldn't and I have to say I think only a couple of days ago my husband said I think we need to revisit that agreement in in our audience today we've got a real mix in here today how many people work from home all the time or work agilely shall I say all all the time so only three four five okay how many people can work agilely as part of their roles probably about half of our kind of working folk of our George Stevenson high school massive how many of you in the room think that their job will be in an office or in an office space Gosh, that's probably only a fifth, maybe. So the rest of you think you'll be out and about, potentially. Okay, interesting. But I think the mental health piece is a massive thing. I, I reflect, I think it was episode four of the, the podcast, there was Liam Kelly talked massively about one of the reasons he had to move back up north from working in London was to have those people around him. I think that's really important. Thank you. Thank you, Newcastle. Question number two. Northern Power Women was in Brussels last week. I was part of a delegation of two combined authorities exchanging best practice and key actions and way forward on gender equality in the North. You know, this was a specific reason we were going for. Do you think traditional conferences with keynote speakers are making way for a more deliberate form of exchange and collaboration? What do you think? We're all, we're at an event today. We've been part of something this morning. But what do you think? Uh, Michelle, what do you think about this? Is collaboration the way forward or do we still need those more formal kind of scheduled events? I think it's a combination of of all of that, really. I think we've recently done some events or or groupings of events where we called it Discover Digital and Discover Culture. So we had these week-long periods where we did different activities. And there was a combination of activities. So it was talks, it was demonstrations, it was workshops. And and we got a lot out of that. And I think that people enjoyed the the collaboration, the, the, the learning new things, but actually getting involved, getting your hands dirty. But similarly, we found a lot of, of useful information from listening to speakers. So I, I don't think that you can just focus on one type of, of t- conference or event. I think having that combination is really valuable. And, and personally, we got a lot out of that. I had to do some talks, but I also ended up joining in some workshops. So, you know, th- there's a lot of benefit there. I think even doing things as opposed to talking about things is really important now. Even from a sales perspective, you know, we get a lot of clients coming in here. They don't just want to have us talk to them about what we're selling or what we're doing for them. It's about demonstrating what we can do. So I think it's not just 
events and functions and, and all of that, I think everybody's expecting to see a little bit more of, of, of or demonstrations a little bit more when, when we come into to places like the office or the a sales environment or a conference environment. And, and even universities, we, we, we've been talking to Newcastle University recently. And again, you know, their whole teaching methods, their processes, how they're teaching, it, it's very, very um, varied as opposed to sitting in a lecture theatre all the time now. So they want to get more hands on. So I, th I think it's not just a conference thing. I think you can take that across a lot of areas uh, and get benefit from having a variation. OK, Mahak. I completely agree with that point because I think there's a place for both of them. So a lot of, it depends what you want to get out of it. So a lot of techies attend hackathons and you know workshops because they want to get that practical hands-on experience learn new technologies and you know work with other technical people at these events whereas a lot of people like to go and listen to somebody and learn from their experiences and take some of the points away and go and implement into their own lives personally in terms of conferences i love when there's a call for action and there's one key thing that they can tell you to take away from that conference and at other times i want to attend workshops so i think there's a but there needs to be a balance and there needs to be both at every event and it is that case of, you know, we go and attend lots of events and we'll scribble down notes and we'll take pictures of the slides, but do we do we go back to them? You know, Thomas, you're you're all over the world at different conferences and very cool ones, very corporate ones. What are your thoughts on this? At the minute, I'm fascinated by the growth in unconferencing um, and having a programme that is essentially dictated by delegates on the day or over the course of a few days. It's a fascinating way to see what delegates actually want from an event um, when there's not been a, a schedule that's actually been planned. I do think there'll always be a place for hearing from industry leaders talking about new research, new developments, and their findings and, and, and imparting their knowledge. But I do feel that the, the, the step towards actually more, more practical-based events, or at least incorporating uh, practical elements into uh, conferencing, is probably the way forward. Thank you. Thoughts? Any more thoughts from the audience about conferences? Because it can can take a lot of our time, can't it? Some of them times it can be quite expensive. Um, you know, do you go? Do you always go with a set idea of what you want from the conference? Deborah, I'm coming to you. Hi. Yes, I think I think uh, there's a future for conferences where you don't just so. For example, if it's a HR conference, you don't just get HR people. You get people from the business community. So. Michelle's talked about culture. So you get people with an interest in culture. Uh, if your conferences are just uh, the same kind of people all coming together, it's a bit of a jolly. Uh, if you can uh, get that mixed audience, I think that's where, that's where the real benefit comes from. I think this event that I was at last week was quite interesting because it was people from sort of different backgrounds. But ultimately, after we had this sort of symposium on one day, the next day we were at European Parliament. And I have to say, there's, there's, there can't be any coincidence that there were 23 normal than women in a room and the next day there was a Brexit agreement. Just, you know, I'm just, say, just saying. But the next day we did have, based on that event that we'd had at the symposium, we could go to the European Parliament with and ask and then they would they went away and said right we now have a series of actions that we are committing to and they've also followed up on that so it's just I think it's just interesting so I think sort of probably from the panel is there's a place for everything do we think yeah, yeah. okay Right, we're on to our final question I can't believe it but if you have any thoughts or questions of uh, conversations that you would like to be discussed on the Northern Power Women podcast please do get in touch at at North Power Women um, or podcast at northernpowerwomen.com last question Ruth Ibeg Buna is one of our power list and she said there should be more women crafting northern powerhouse policy should have been in Brussels last week as northern women are famously strong and resilient which iconic northern woman real or fictional alive or dead would you choose to head up the northern powerhouse and why I love this one <laughs> I chose uh, Brenda Hill. So she's the president of Supreme Court, appointed at the age of 72. What I find quite remarkable is that she was appointed by Theresa May. So it was quite nice to see one female leader appoint another female leader and help their career. And, you know, we, in terms of diversity and inclusion, we always talk about, you know, it's the ideas that helping younger women on the ladder and helping them progress. But it's quite remarkable that she's achieved this at 72. 
Also, she joined House of Lords as Lord Appeal in Ordinary, the only female to have served in that position. I think she'd be great to head up the Northern Powerhouse. Fantastic. We'll send you a letter after this. <laughs> Thomas, Thomas, who is your choice of leader? So I thought about this for a while and the ideal choice seemed to be Kate Eddy. She's resilient, uh, highly respected, very good at what she does, and she's quite happy to fly into a war zone, which... Uh, if you know, know know anything about the Northern Powerhouse, it can often uh, of, often seem that way. A peacemaker, I feel. Michelle. Yeah, so, so my ideas on this was uh, Elizabeth Gaskell, who, who is an author, who was, a, I think she was born around the 18, 1800s. So she was very, uh, although she was actually born in the South, she was born in London, but I think a, a lot of her career is associated with the North. She spent a lot of her time in Manchester, but also she actually spent two years of her, her career in Newcastle, where she lived with um, a family who, who, who was a minister for a Unitarian church up here. But she very much focused on, on women's issues, um, poor issues, things about social and economics, things. So, so the things that she was talking about in sort of the mid 18th century are still very relevant today. So uh, that's what I thought her. So Elizabeth, Brenda Hale, and Kate Ady. Right, we must have some takers in the audience for who's going to, because it's not going to be just the leader of the Northern Powerhouse now we're looking for. We need that whole, that whole committee. Sophie, I knew I'd get you. <laughs> I'm just having a look around because the person I would choose, I think she's gone now, but um, I've got a really tight bunch of business buddies that get stuff done, right? So I would put at least one of them on it. So I think, um, I was going to say Claire Talbot-Jones, she's just dipped out um, because she is very principled. She is very open and honest around her values and what's important to her. She's very ethical in what she does, but also she gets stuff done. So once she decides to do something, she'll make it happen. And I think that's definitely what we need in this situation. Well, I would definitely pick some of the, uh, the young women from uh, the school this morning because they were amazing. Listen, we want to thank you all so much for taking part in today's live recording of episode 29 of the Northern Power Women podcast. I want to say a big thank you to Michelle Crosby, Mahakman and Thomas Jackson for taking part in this episode. Thank all of you. A massive big thanks to DXC for hosting us here today. Thank you, everyone, Newcastle. Big thank you again to our wonderful panel and also to DXC for hosting us. And to you, of course, if you came along to take part. We do love to see you, so keep your eye on Twitter at North Power Women for details of our next recording. And of course, if you'd like to host us, would you like us to come and pay you a visit? We would love to come. Just get in touch, podcast at northernpowerwomen.com. Now, this month's interview is with someone who has an extraordinary story to tell about success, loss and resilience. Dr. Joanna Berry is the Associate Professor of Entrepreneurship at Durham University Business School. Joanna began her career in law before deciding to leave the profession and set up her own business. She enjoyed international success during the dot-com boom of the 90s and then of course the crash happened. Today she describes herself as a pracademic and I started by asking her what that meant. A pracademic is somebody who has practical experience of the academic subject that they teach. That's It's my word, that's my definition. Other people may have different ones, but there are an awful lot of people around who will call themselves um, academics and who are very, very highly respected and highly regarded academics who have huge amounts of theoretical experience but who've never actually walk the walk mm. that they talk about and that's sometimes just because it you know it's the way the world works you can be a, an economist without ever having worked in a in an organization where actually the macroeconomy and the microeconomy matter but in entrepreneurship and in new venture creation and starting new businesses i just think it's very difficult to legitimately incredibly teach that subject unless you've done it yourself mm theories about how important failure is really don't match up to the personal experience of having lost everything <laughs> you know to put it in an extreme way absolutely well I want to get to that point and talk about those experiences that you have had but I want to go back first of all because business wasn't something that that you 
you thought you would embrace from the outset because you studied law. What happened there? I why did. did you why did you decide to leave that profession? I do this presentation to school children and it's called Career is a Verb as well as a Noun. <laughs> and and I think that was <laughs> the law degree was very much part of career as a verb. It happened for, for the very fundamental reason that I was an extremely good child and I did what my parents told me. And I am of a generation where my parents and my dad and mum are very forward thinking people. They're still alive at 89 and 90. So they're doing something right. But they had three daughters and they wanted all of us to be independent. And I got two opportunities to go to Oxford University. One was to do English and one was to do law. And my parents said to me, you can read a book anytime. Go and do law and you will always be independent. So I did what I was told to do and I went off and did my law degree yeah. and I hated it. When I look back and I look at the students that I teach and I look at my 19 year old, yeah. I, I think I would have been far happier had I done the degree that I wanted to do, that my heart was in rather than the one that was a good, a good thing for me at the time. So that was sort of one of those big life lessons that I learned very early on. Absolutely. You know, you went to South Africa, you studied law, you, you, you know, you practiced law, you came back and you found yourself in London. What was that initial spark then, Joanna? Because you, as you said, you hadn't studied business. You hadn't done an MBA at that point. You hadn't studied business at school. What, what attracted no. you? What was that spark that made you start your own business for the very first time? I was uh, very lucky in that I went, when I first came back to the UK, I went to work for a company called Haymarket, Haymarket Publishing. Yeah. And that's where I learned to sell. And it turned out that I was actually quite good at it. And being able to sell is, I think, a pretty fundamental and frequently looked down upon skill. Mm. Um, but it was one of the first times that I came across something that I seemed to have a natural talent for. And I think that ability to sell yourself to sell a product to sell a service to promote something well is something that some people have and some people don't I took that forward in the first instance in what I knew which was because my parents had always been employed and my brothers and sisters were all employed by other people I thought that's sort of what you did so I stayed employed by other people in big international business development roles and I got the opportunity to run my own company when I had to stop traveling because I got a bit poorly and I couldn't go up and down in airplanes all the time. So I used all of my savings and bought the National Register of Personal Fitness Trainers. And that's the first time that I had the opportunity to run my own show. And I just loved it. I just loved it. Did you know what to do? I mean, you... you... Was it just your gut that, leading that, you? No, that was that was half the fun of it, really. Because <laughs> whatever I did, and I, I'm not a particularly good follower, and I'm not a particularly good leader. I, but I, I knew running this that I, if whatever I did was going to make the difference, and whatever I left out or omitted or forgot to do or did or chose not to do, was going to make a difference. And I really enjoyed that feeling of autonomy and that. That's something that's driven me hugely ever since in everything that I do. That there's something in me that really needs autonomy, really yeah. needs the ability to say, right, I will do it and I choose to do it this way or that way or I choose not to do it at all. And I, I just loved it. And somehow everything I'd ever done from learning how to cross the T's and dot the I's in my law degree, that, everything I did had taught me something, even if I'd never, even if I'd not enjoyed it, through to learning to sell things at Haymarket, through to dealing with people at all levels from chief executives and prime ministers through to the person that delivers the newspaper. All of these skill sets all came together in running this little company Really fascinating to hear that it was it was a, almost a slow realization that wait a minute I might not think on paper I've got the skill set to run a business but wait a minute I've done negotiation selling um, I've learned I've learned all about as you said attention to detail and I think that's maybe a block for a lot of people when they look at yeah. other and they go well they're an entrepreneur I wouldn't know where to begin actually exactly. you, actually you would I'm interested in hearing whether as a female running a business. Did it feel like a man's world when you looked around at other CEOs? Were they men or were, was it a kind of fairly even split? Across the time that I ran my own companies, there was very definitely a sense that I was a bit of a second-class citizen, particularly in the, mm. in the tech world. 
which was the the big big company that that sank me basically or it didn't sink me because here I am still standing but yeah. that was the one that was really painful um because in the world of technology in 1997 98 the company which was called B Studios um was creating interactive content for TV stations and in that world it was largely male dominated pretty much every programmer was a male and I think all of our clients, BBC, Sky, Flextech, NTL, they were all male. Every single person that I was, in effect, selling to, that mm. I was developing business with, were all blokes. And I was rep representing a team that was pretty much all men. So you had to deal with the casual, everyday, and I'm not even going to call it unconscious bias because it was very conscious bias, of the, oh, she's just the, you know, the dolly that they've put at the front of the team to try and get us to smile at her and buy something. How did you deal with that? <laughs> By learning how everything worked so that when they started trying to confuse me with complicated conversations about source code and object code and Python and stuff like that, I knew exactly what they were talking about and I could talk it back at them and better. So that was quite satisfying. But again, it took a little bit of doing you know and uh, which speaks again to something that I've always always done which is learn every single step that I've taken has always stretched me in one way shape or form and mm -hmm. starting B Studios was the first time I'd run a serious sized organization it was 27 people at its biggest and the first time that we'd won awards on an international stage and was the first time that I'd been in business with some serious business partners and where you learn lessons about the people you can trust and the people that you can't. Mm. So, you know, every step I've taken has has taught me something. And, and you know, the difference between source code and object code, <laughs> there you go, that's one that I haven't forgotten. <laughs> I mean, this was the height of the dot-com boom. And then, of course, we all remember that that beautiful, big, shiny bubble then burst. And that's yes. and that's what you experienced, and you've you've talked about it, you know, crashing around your ears. Yeah, that yeah. must have been an incredibly painful thing to live through. How at the time did you deal with that? It sharpened some of my edges for sure, in a way that I don't always still like very much. But so it was two thousand. My baby was born, and his dad left a few days before he was born and and that was it I haven't seen or heard from him since so that's fine I could deal with that but at the same time because he was the other half of the partnership that had started this company yeah. the other letter in the name of the company I had to make sure that the company kept going and that's quite complicated and especially when you're a new mom and you have maybe five or six days off and then you've really got to go back to work to make sure that everything keeps ticking over so the baby went under a under the desk yes. and uh, and it was it was interesting times so it was quite tiring and that we were better than most I had a fantastic chairman who kept things steady for longer than a lot of companies did together with me so we were slightly more slow and gradual as we approached the brick wall but we still hit it. Mm. The fact was we were creating international award-winning content that was utterly beautiful that nobody could afford. How did that loss affect you, what you'd built up for so many years? You'd been so incredibly <laughs> successful. How did, how, did, how did it affect you and how did you get over that? It was pretty horrid, really. Um, how did it affect me? When my business crashed and burned and it took a little while to do that so it was quite a slow painful pulling off of a very sticky plaster it left me feeling like I had an enormous amount to prove to myself to my family particularly my mum and dad who'd been huge believers and I felt like I'd let them down terribly I had a two-year-old at the time who was totally dependent on me, as well as having everybody in the company that was dependent on me. And I felt like I'd let them down as well. So I was impoverished and my ego had taken a thorough battering. And the only thing that I could do was carry on. Sometimes you just have to put one foot in front of the other. Mm. And that's 
and I have to look back at it because at the time I've no idea. It's not quite a blur. It's not quite a blank spot, but it's not a time that I think about very often. It's a bit like childbirth. You know, you don't <laughs> replay it in agonizing detail for those of you with children. So I don't go back and replay it bit by bit, but I do remember just that sense of having to put one foot in front of the next foot and of reaching out and leaning on the people that I knew I could trust. And for me at that time, it was family. But also that's when you really find out who your friends are and the people that stick by you, even though you're not shiny anymore and you're not off to San Francisco to pick up awards and sitting on the front cover of trade press and doing radio shows and all that stuff. But the people that still care about how you actually are really do become very, very apparent when you're going through that. Mm. So how I felt was flattened, lost, in more mortification and embarrassment than I think I'd ever been because my ego didn't like it that I hadn't made it through. And I think I look back now and the lessons that I learned from that were that you can survive, that you do survive, that you find out who your friends are and that you have to look after yourself. And it, it was an, an enormous learning time for me, but I didn't know that at the time. It's only now I look back at it that I realize quite what lessons I learned. So it was exasperating, but because it was happening to everybody, I didn't feel like it was my fault per yeah. se. But having Charlie on top of all of that stuff to deal with was uh, was an additional. But I was quite tired, really. <laughs> so I said to the I said to the chairman, at uh, I think Charlie must have been about two, um, just coming up to two, that I thought I'd better go and do an MBA, park this international award-winning intellectual property on a shelf somewhere, and I'll go and do my MBA, and I'll be back in a year and use up the rest of my savings to go and do that. So I came home and lived with mum and dad in Hartlepool and did my MBA. And here I still am in the northeast of England, and I never went back. Mm. I loved doing my MBA, and I got offered an opportunity to do a PhD, and there's now, as I look back at it from the giddy heights of you know, almost 20 years later, I was, I was very, very tired. And the opportunity to do one thing really well for the first time in many years where I've been spinning plates left, right and centre to try and keep the business going and try and make sure everybody could pay their rent and pay their mortgages and make sure that the clients were happy and all of that stuff. Instead of that, I was doing one thing. I was doing my PhD and it was a real luxury and mm. it feels now looking back like it was a bit self-indulgent really but I was very pleased to find a little bit of sanctuary in the academic environment and I I remain there to this day. Uh, and how different is the northeast today to the northeast you grew up in because of course you did you grew up in Hartlepool you grew up in across the northeast mm. but you actually did all your business in the south and I know now that you're really involved with you work with lots of new businesses and, and businesses that are looking to grow and develop you chair the Northeast Institute of Directors how is business in the northeast now it's not the case anymore is it that people need to ship out in order to be successful you're absolutely right that's one of the things that I am forever banging on about but I think the answer to your question is that business in the northeast is doing really really well it is a creative innovative, clever, smart place to be with some astonishing stuff happening in life sciences, in subsea, in the creative and digital industries. We are just absolutely crap at telling our own stories. Excuse my language. <laughs> but we're really not good at telling the stories of the, of the wonderful, fabulous things that we're doing. I'll, I'll give you an example. I was going around a factory a couple of days ago called Prima Cheese, and Prima Cheese export 30% of their product, which, believe it or not, is cheese. <laughs> Largely, greater, different, there are 360, I think, different versions of grated mozzarella, and I now know the difference between grated cheese and shredded cheese, which is equally exciting, <laughs> and I have some fantastic pictures of the cheese factory, which is great. But they employ hundreds of people in the Northeast. They're based in Siam. 
They're run by a second generation, almost second generation now Iranian family who started off being producing the cheese and have just grown and grown and grown. They've got these fantastic new factory. They are lean. They are smart. They've got the most up to date technology. They are so innovative. And yet nobody knows that they're there. So we are well, thank you very much here in the Northeast and doing extremely well and just not so very good at telling people that. So the reputation of flat cap and whippets still unfortunately hangs around us a little bit. And what about women business owners now and the attitudes towards women owning and running their own businesses? That I think is something that has changed in the Northeast to the extent that it's no longer there still aren't enough of them, but they're coming up through the ranks. That's a generational thing. But it's no longer unusual to see a woman in a, a powerful position. There are some fantastic examples up here. We've got, uh, if you look at Giselle Stewart, who runs a software company called Ubisoft. She also sits on the board of the University Technical College. And uh, and we've got, I mean, my head of school, Susan Hart. She's uh, obviously a female. And we've got some really great examples and really great role models of people like Simone, who runs Northern Power mm. Women, who are full of energy and smarts and attitude and positivity without being in the least bit spiky or spiteful or selfish and without being queen bees about it you know there's a really helpful network of fabulous women in the northeast of england and i'm very proud to be part of that we still hear though don't we? I mean, there were some studies out just this year that show that women are less likely to secure funding or business loans than, oh yes than that's men. definitely true why yeah. is, why is that how do we shape that yes. up this is the unconscious and I, I am going to be charitable and call it unconscious bias of the largely male venture capital community I have a, a, a colleague of mine uh, that I love dearly. She's fantastic, Yvonne Gale. She's chief exec of one of the big Northeast venture capital funds, but she is very unusual in being a, a woman in that position. And I have no doubt that there is a very clear and very probably conscious bias against investing in women because, well, I don't know, are the, are the little darlings going to go off and get pregnant and suddenly find that they've got other things to occupy them and they'll lose their focus on the business or, you know, are they going to just find a wealthy man and marry him and then they won't need this little vanity project of theirs anymore, will they? And that sort of patronising attitude is very rarely as overt as that. I exaggerated to make a point, yeah. but but I do think it is still there. And it just means that we have to work that little bit harder to prove ourselves. And we do. Without being strident about it, I think that there is a very strong community of women in the Northeast. If you look at Leanne Walker at Walker Filtration and Helen Kadzow, who's busy building student accommodation left, right and centre. Jackie Miller, Charlton, who got her, I want to say CVE, Jackie, if I've got that wrong, forgive me. Uh, but got her award for services to, con to the construction industry. Yeah. There are some amazing women that are just carrying on doing what they do and not listening to those, not listening to those voices. But you're right, the statistics unfortunately can't be argued with, and that's something that women can only combat by just continuing to be very good at what they do, mm. and that men have got to start helping us with by really being conscious of otherwise unconscious bias. I was going to ask you about your advice to young women who are attracted by business but don't know where to begin. But actually, after talking to you, I want to scrap the young women because actually, particularly women, but at any point in her career, who's had that voice mm -hmm. on her shoulder going, what, what, you know, but, oh, you can't do that because you don't really know how to run a business. What would your advice be to any woman thinking, I I'm attracted by that, but I don't know where to start? Reach out to other women. There is no doubt that the power of the network is massive. Find people that are doing something that you admire, link in with them on LinkedIn, hook up with them at local networking events, write to them and say, I admire you. Can I have a cup of coffee with you? There is no doubt that there is a real value in being direct like that. But also don't think that you have to throw absolutely everything, your children, your partner, your business, your house, your car out of the window and start from scratch and starve in a garret. 
there is no reason why you can't investigate opportunities to run a business as a hobby to start with yeah. and see how it goes. Don't be intimidated, but do ask for help. Dr. Joanna Berry there from Durham University with some brilliant life lessons. Whose career and life would you like to know more about? Do get in touch and let us know. You can email podcast at northernpowerwomen.com. Now, it's time for your Northern Power Women shout outs, a place where you can give a big thanks to someone who has gone that extra mile, stepped out their comfort zone or just done some incredible work. Anyone basically deserves a big pat on the back. So listen up because you might just be mentioned. My name's Thomas Jackson and I want to give a shout out to Herb Kim because he's raising the profile of the North by bringing awesome speakers through a range of fantastic conferences. He works for Thinking Digital Conference and his Twitter handle is at Herb Kim. Hi, I'm Jane Dalton, founding director of Groundswell Innovation. We're at Groundswell Idea on Twitter. I wanted to give a Northern Power Women shout out to everyone at Wash Design Agency in Preston, Andy Wormsley, Lindsay Thompson and the team. There you can find them as Wash Design on Twitter. They've been doing some great work, uh, lots and lots of fantastic video stuff, so well done to them. My name is Lauren. I'd like to give a Northern Power shout out to Nikki Wilton because she's personally helped me along my tech career and she's passionate about women in sales. She works for DXC Technology. My name is Ben. I want to give a Northern Power shout out to Lynn Simpson because of all the hard work she puts into the girls' network. They work for George Stevenson High School. Hi, I'm the Naughty Farrakh. I'm the founder of The Stampered Life, Master of Ceremonies and Television Presenter. You can find me on Twitter at Minoti Parik. And I want to give a Northern Power Women shout out to my husband, Samir Manjekar. Uh, his Twitter handle is null.net. And I just want to give a shout out for being such an amazing and supportive partner. And he's really helped me build my business here. So massive, massive shout out to him, Samir. Hi, my name's Grace Bella and I'm the founder of Miss Kick. We are the female football brand that's trying to inspire more girls into football. Our Twitter handle is at Miss Kick. I'd like to give a Northern Power Woman shout out to Heather Waters because she's absolutely amazing and she's been really influential in helping me get the brand out there. And her Twitter handle is Heather Waters15. Um, my name is Michelle Partington. I'm owner of Mentis Training and Consultancy. My um, Twitter handle is at Mitsan UK. I want to give a Northern Power Women shout out to Stacey Copeland at Scotland Boxer, um, just because she's awesome and does so much for the young women and girls of sport. Thank you for sending us your shout outs. If there's someone you think deserves a mention, let us know. You can send us a voice memo, an email podcast at northernpowerwomen.com or of course come and catch up with us at our next live panel recording as well. Keep your eye on Twitter at North Power Women for all the details of that. Now next month, As The Hive is back. It's the place where you can share your wisdom with someone who needs a bit of help and advice. This time, it's about staying in a job you don't like so your career history doesn't look scrappy. I left my last job just after six months as my boyfriend got a job in another town and we moved. Now I hate my new job, but I've only been here six months. Would it look terrible if I move again so soon or should I stick it out? Can you help? What should she do? Stick it out for longer to make her CV look better or cut her losses and run? Any advice, really welcome, please. You can get in touch and email podcast at northernpowerwomen.com. Share your thoughts with us again at the next live panel recording. We'd love to hear from you. Well, there we go for yet another month of great stories, advice and ideas. A huge thank you to you for listening. We really do appreciate it. And we would love you to tell your friends, your colleagues, your neighbours, your family, whoever the heck you fancy. The more people who join the conversation, the better. And of course, a rating or a review wherever you hear your podcast from means there's more chance of other people finding us as well. So if you can spend a couple of minutes on that, we'd really, really appreciate it save the date the next episode comes for you on tuesday december the 3rd until then this is the northern power women podcast i'm sam walker and this has been a what goes on media production for northern power women